Greetings. My name is Kevin Reddick, and I welcome you to my channel, Conversations from the Hot Box. Here, we're passionate about discussing real-life issues, and I do so from a Christian biblical perspective. Today's conversation addresses Christian's position in this American political climate. And this conversation is actually a, a, a spillover from this weekend, uh, meeting with some men uh, and just discussing discussing uh, this, this current political climate that we're in and the various statements and comments we're hearing on social media from Christians and, and politicians and civic leaders and so forth. So jump in the car, let's ride. Now, let me state this first and foremost. I am a Christian. I am a convert, actually, from the religion of Islam, and I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And with that being said, I'm moved to share my thoughts, which I'm sure will probably be a little controversial. <laughs> In the current political climate in America, in which many Christian leaders are speaking out, I have a grave concern that I would like to share with my fellow Christians for your consideration. For various reasons, uh, America is experiencing a growing distrust in the institution of the church and its leadership. In the wake of this highly divisive election period, with not only American citizens, but the world watching and listening to what's being represented on various platforms, it's important now, more than ever, that Christians are portraying Jesus and the Christian faith. Again, I'm not trying to present myself as the Christian police. <laughs> I'm just sharing my concerns as a Christian and American citizen. You know, I, I've been listening to many fellow believers who have stated that they support one of the presidential candidates because of their stance on abortion, because abortion is against the will of God. It is a sin. They say the other candidate lacks Christian values. And this approach to politics in America is not new. However, the outcome of this election carries an importance like none of them. And so here, here is my concern. It sounds very hypocritical and disingenuous to support an individual because of their claimed stance against what is considered a sin, abortion by some, yet ignore the many various sins that person not only takes a stand for but actually commits. This makes Christians appear very narrow-minded and self-absorbed, not Christ-absorbed. Do you think Jesus would have accepted or supported the Roman government just because Caesar agreed that feeding human beings to lions was a sin, yet they continue to engage in countless acts of violence, perversion, deception, lust, etc. And there's another issue. Christians have cited the Bible to argue why this decision about abortion should uh, either be celebrated or, or, or discarded. But here's the problem. This 2,000-year-old text we call the Bible says nothing about abortion. Abortions were known and practiced in biblical times, although the methods were significantly different from the, what we do today. Yet, they still existed. And the Bible was written in a world in which abortion was practiced and viewed uh, with some nuance. Yet, the Hebrew and Greek equivalents of the word abortion do not appear in either the Old or New Testaments of the Bible. That is, 
the topic of abortion simply is not directly mentioned. The absence of an explicit reference to abortion, however, has not stopped opponents or proponents from looking to the Bible for support for their positions. Abortion opponents turn to several biblical texts that, taken together, seem to suggest that human life has value before birth, such as uh, what was recorded in the book of Psalms uh, 139, which states that God knit together uh, uh, the rider in his mother's womb. Supporters can point to other biblical texts that would seem to count as evidence in their favor. For example, Exodus 21 suggests that a pregnant woman's life is more valuable than its fetus. This text describes a scenario in which men who are fighting, the men who are fighting, if they happen to strike a pregnant woman and cause her to miscarry, in that case, a monetary fine would be imposed if the woman suffers no other harm beyond the, beyond the miscarriage. However, if the woman suffers additional harm, the perpetrator's punishment is to suffer uh, harm up to and for life. Unlike abortion, there are many sins that are clearly defined as sins against God in the Bible. For example, Mark chapter 7, verses 21, 23 states, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetedness, wickedness, deceit, viciousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. The first thing mentioned here is evil thoughts. And then it goes on to mention deceit. Now, I bring up evil thoughts and deceit because one, evil thoughts was the first thing mentioned. But the two actually go hand in hand because included in the package of evil thoughts are deceptions. Deception is the intentional misleading of another, and many biblical characters use deceptive means to achieve their purposes at, at cost to others. Now, it would be better for many of the Christians who support Trump to honestly state their reasons other than to imply that his biblical principles are the reason they support him. And I say this because his public and revealed private actions do not depict an individual living a biblically principled life. Lately, he has been involved in a massive deceptive campaign that is dangerous and hurtful to others in addition to advocating violence. Things that are directly denounced in the Bible as sin. Check this. Former Illinois Congressman Joe Walsh, 2020 presidential candidate and director of The Social Contract. Joe is also a member of the Republicans for Harris Initiative. Maya, Joe, thank you both very much for coming to the Sunday show. Maya, you're the newbie here. So your reaction to Donald Trump saying all that nonsense and lies and I can't curse, it's Sunday. Curse. Well, I, I don't think we need to curse. I think what we can say is that it's dangerous. And I think that's the most, that that is the way we can condemn it the most. The, this is a community of people. People are dealing with displacement. They're dealing with shortages. We are, we're, this is a moment that a country should come together and the Republican nominee for president is going out of his way to scare people. And he's lying. None of this is true. Right. It is easily provably untrue. Right. But he's doing it because he thinks he can get a political gain from it. Now, during that rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, he and his allies accused Democrats of trying to kill him. First, they tried to silence him. When that didn't work, they tried to bankrupt him. 
When that didn't work, they tried to jail him. And with all the hatred they have spewed at President Trump, it was only a matter of time before somebody tried to kill him. And then, guys, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. This is a pivotal moment for our country. And I don't even have to tell anybody that here. We can all feel it. This is no longer a fight between Republican versus Democrat, left versus right. It is good versus evil. Trump and Vance lying about people of Ohio eating dogs and cats. And yet the governor of Ohio, the Republican governor of Ohio, lifelong Republican, telling them to stop, that it is a lie. And now with the people of the Carolinas suffering in a way that uh, only those who have gone through uh, tragic hurricanes, like Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Camille, uh, and, and now this hurricane could, could imagine. Donald Trump, J.D. Vance, Eric Trump, everyone else in the Republican Party, entire news channels, out and out lying about what's going on on the ground there. Talking about civil war. It, 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 it's, it's staggering. Just staggering when you have Republican governors from those states, Republican senators from those states, Republican mayors from those states, Republican county commissioners from those states, Republican officials from those states saying that they're doing great. That in a tragic situation, they are coordinating very well with the federal government. Donald Trump, shame on Donald Trump. Show this, show this Charlotte Observer uh, uh, headline. It's an it's a editorial from the largest paper in the state of North Carolina. Shame on Donald Trump mm. for worsening North Carolina's tragedy with political lies. And now the lie about Democrats trying to kill. In the teachings of Christianity, Jesus is often portrayed as a compassionate and forgiving figure, welcoming all who seek him with open arms. However, Jesus was not narrow-minded when it came to certain sins, overlooking all others because of one particular transgression. The concept of sin in Christianity is complex and multifaceted. It is often defined as any thought, action, or behavior that goes against the will and commands of God. In the Bible, sin is described as the root of all evil and evil and the cause of separation between mankind and God. Part of the problem is that we, as Christians, need to understand and accept the fact that America will never have a politician who will have all of their policies biblically based because this is not a Christian nation. It never was. And so how could an elected president of the United States of America place their hand on a Bible or take an oath declaring that he or she will be a president representing all the people of the United States, looking out for the well-being of all of its citizens while seeking to outcast those who may not believe as they did. Yet, some of those people even supported it. Christian nationalists often claim that the United States was founded to be a Christian nation. Even some politicians agree. But if the people who make this assertion are merely saying that most Americans are Christians, I would agree with it. But those who argue that America is a Christian nation usually mean something more uh, 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 governmental. They usually mean that uh, or insist rather that the country should officially be Christian. Religious extremists and their allies insist that the United States was 
designed to be officially Christian and that our law should enforce the doctrines of at least their version of Christianity. If America was meant to be a Christian nation by the founders, they would make the Bible and the Constitution one and the same. They would not just have included a few references of scripture in the Constitution. There would be no argument at all regarding the separation of church and state because the two would be one. In fact, the United States Constitution is a wholly secular document. It contains no mention of Christianity or Jesus Christ. In fact, the Constitution refers to religion only twice in the First Amendment, which bars laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And in Article 6, which prohibits religious tests for public office. So both of these provisions are evidence that the country was not founded as an officially, excuse me, as an officially Christian nation. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution declares that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The Founding Fathers did not create a secular government because they disliked religion. They did so because they were actually fleeing from religious persecution. Many were believers themselves, yet they had studied and even seen firsthand religious wars and persecutions in Europe. Some colonies had officially established churches and taxed all the citizens to support them, whether they were members or not. Some limited public officials and public office to Christians and dissenters faced imprisonment, torture, and even death. Respect for religious diversity gradually became the norm. For example, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he spoke of undeniable rights endowed by our Creator. He used generic religious language that all religious groups of the day could respond to, not narrow Christian language. Now, while some of the country's founders believed that the government should espouse Christianity, that viewpoint soon became a losing proposal. In Virginia, Patrick Henry argued in favor of tax support for Christian churches, but Henry and his supporters were in the minority and lost that battle. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and their allies among the state's religious groups ended Virginia's established church and helped pass the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty in 1786. And it was a law guaranteeing religious freedom to all. In that statute, it stated, we, the General Assembly of Virginia, do an act that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, place, or ministry whatsoever, nor shall be enforced, restrained, molested, or bothered in his body or goods, nor, other, or nor shall otherwise suffer on account of his religious beliefs or opinions, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinions in matters of religion and that the same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil and civic, rather, capabilities. When the Constitution and later the Bill of Rights were written, the concept of a Christian nation was not factored in. Instead, our nation's government 
and its governing document ensures religious freedom for everyone. In addition, the Constitution did not give the government authority over religion. Again, Article 6, which allows persons of all religious viewpoints to hold public office, was adopted unanimously. And this is how the wall was built to separate church and state. President George Washington, in a uh, now famous 1790 letter to a Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, celebrated that Jews had complete freedom of worship in America. Noted uh, President Washington, he stated, all possessions alike, liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. I'll say it again. He said, all possess alike, liberties of conscience and immunities of citizenship. Washington's administration even negotiated a treaty with the Muslim rulers of North Africa that stated explicitly that the United States was not a Christian nation. The pact known as the Treaty with Tripoli was approved unanimously by the Senate in 1797 under the administration of John Adams. And Article 11 of the treaty stated, the government of the United States is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Our government declared itself to be a neutral uh, government on religious matters, leaving such decisions to individuals. This democratic and pluralistic system has allowed a broad array of religious groups to grow and flourish with guarantees that every individual American had the right to determine his or her own spiritual path or to reject religion entirely. As a result of this policy, Americans enjoy more religious freedom than any other people in world history. Now, we should be proud of this accomplishment, accomplishment in some aspects, <laughs> and we should work to preserve the constitutional principle that made it possible, the separation of church and state. And I'm saying all of this, if, if we're uh, going to adhere to what the Constitution has already established, you know. Now, if there should be a change collectively in the total government of the United States that this should be a Christian nation, then let's pursue that. And I would be in support of that. But until such time, our job, I believe, as Christians, our responsibility uh, in, in modeling Jesus and the early believers while they were in Rome under Roman rule, uh, the, the, the old adage, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, <laughs> uh, will apply here to some degree. You know, we don't have to adhere to everything the government says that we can do. You know, we have our own principles. We have our own constitution as citizens of the kingdom of God. Our constitution is the Bible. And so we live by that. We follow our mandate to go forth and proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to those willing to hear it and accept it. And we go on to advance God's kingdom in that way. Uh, not necessarily politically, not necessarily invoking the government, but just proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and inviting uh, uh, those who we put share that gospel with to come in and be a part of God's kingdom. Now, what say you? I hope you enjoyed the ride today. Please uh, hit the subscribe button, the notification buttons, and revisit our channel for more engaging and enlightening uh, videos.
If you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please click on the button labeled Prayer of Salvation or in the link in the description section below. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me. And as always, peace and blessings to you and your households.